Well, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tim Jones. I'm one of the founders of the company. My background is uh, um, in sales and super passionate about helping companies sell more, better. And uh, I'd love to be here in front of this group who actually care about the same things that I do and, and have some good discussion about um, how we can all be more successful at this game, right? So uh, really been looking forward to this very much and very excited to have a great panel. Uh, we've got two guests um, that are here with us, uh, Rick Monkarsh from Campari. He's the Vice President of On-Premise, uh, which is a very big title. He's got a very big role, as a matter of fact. He's managing a, a massive new on-premise uh, initiative that the company has um, with resources in the field uh, and a lot of uh, uh, trade marketing uh, initiatives and programming going behind it, uh, as well as national accounts in the on-premise. Um, and uh, very happy to have them as a customer. So hello, Rick. And uh, Rebecca is our host here. So let's give them another round of applause, please, for having us. Thank you so much. Rebecca is the director of sales here at Gergich. Uh, and uh, again, I can tell I've only met her in person for a few minutes, but are very passionate about selling and what this business uh, presents and the opportunities out there. So uh, I think we're going to have a great conversation, which is going to be focused all around best practices for how to execute what we call your leading indicators of sales. So I'm gonna take a minute to sort of level set and, and get everyone familiar with this terminology so we can talk through it. I remember the days when we used to go as a supplier to a distributor and hand them a goal that somebody in finance or marketing came up with that said that you have to sell this many cases this year. And uh, we basically said, "Good, go out and get it done. And the distributor said, we're gonna go out and get it done. And they went out and they tried to go out and get it done and you either made your number or you didn't. Uh, Things have evolved significantly since then, right? A lot of the things that Ben was talking about with targeting the right accounts and putting the right brands in the right place and executing the right program with the right uh, customers uh, is obviously very critical to driving your sales. So we're a firm believer that if you focus on executing the things that drive your sales, then you will be successful. If you focus on how many cases did I, do I need to sell and, uh, and, and, and work with your partners about quantitative um, evaluations like that, you are likely to miss the boat and not actually execute well at all and miss your numbers. Um, there is a lot of research behind um, you know, having sales teams focus on leading indicators of sales, right? Uh, I can't sell 100 cases in, to, you know, in the off-premise unless I do a few things, right? Like, make sure I get some displays built, right, for one thing. Um, make presentations to the right accounts. I mean, there's, other, there's lots of different activities sales reps need to do in order to sell product and make sure it pulls through. And that's really what our kind of core methodology is about, helping your sales teams execute the right things and the right accounts so that your sales can thrive and grow, okay? So we're gonna to talk today about best practices uh, for doing that um, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and get into a bit more detail on some of the specific techniques maybe that people are, are using and how they're using grapevines to do it, uh, so some of the things that have already been said, okay? So again, leading indicators of sales, your sales drivers, right? What do you need, what are the things you must do in order to be successful, right? And there are things like, sure, get the distribution, but then it's getting the right visibility for the product, right? Right place on the shelf, being the right price, getting on display, having other promotions, maybe it's tastings, maybe it's getting menu placements, et cetera. Those are the leading indicators of getting good sales results. The lagging indicators are, how many cases did you sell at the end of the day, okay? And now we can do quantitative research, either through grapevines or other places, that say, hey, I know now that if I get a buy the glass placement in a key account that I've targeted, I know I'm gonna get about this many cases per month, right? Which means, let me work backwards. I got a goal to sell 5,000 cases. That means I have to get, you know, 85 buy the glass placements in these accounts, or I'm not gonna make my number. So focus on those accounts and getting buy the glass. Forget the big number at the end of the day, okay? So that's kind of where we're, we're gonna go with this. Um, and at the sales rep level, you really got to focus them in on executing the little things and executing the right activities and the right accounts, right? And measure them and, and 
uh, inspire them to do better. So the core tenet is, look, focus teams on executing the leading indicators so that you can deliver better results and sustainable results. Okay? So I've said a lot. Uh, now I'm gonna, we're going to start to engage a bit more with the panel and then talk through a couple of key questions around these, these topics. Uh, number one, um, you need to define your strategy before you can go out and execute something. Okay? We've talked a little bit about that already with the first panel. Things like, um, you know, you need to figure out what you want to focus on. Right? How do companies figure out what to focus on uh, and, and then go out and execute that? We're going to talk a little bit about that. But then once you've decided what to do, how do you get your people in the field focused on doing those things? And how do you make sure they're doing all those the right things? And then lastly, how do you analyze the performance? Right? How do you analyze how well you've done against that mission of executing these specific activities? So we're going to have those, those discussions, and uh, it's probably going to go a lot of different places. Uh, but let me open it up by asking um, Rick, you know, work for a large uh, spirits supplier, a global company with a lot of, a lot of corporate strategy behind brands and initiatives. Um, I'm sure. Um, but what, how do you define a good strategy? And, and sort of how at Campari or other companies you work with, do you, uh, does your company develop specific strategic initiatives uh, for your brands, for your people to go and execute? Yeah. So um, about, a, uh, about a year ago, uh, Grupo Campari, we're, we're based out of Milan. They decided to invest a lot in the United States. And about a year ago, we added... Um, about 50 some people to the on-premise, which is all customer facing, a little bit unique where we don't, uh, the, the customer facing really has no distributor uh, management. Uh, we have a distributor facing team. This is a customer facing team. Uh, we built up national accounts, falls under that. And at the same time, we added about 15 people to a trade marketing department as well that's building programs. So we start out with uh, taking the global segmentation model. We talked about uh, segmentation a lot. Um, and, and trying to adhere, how does the U.S., so that there's a common language across the globe for, for our group, uh, define what fine dining is, uh, fun time to, together bar, things like that, taking basically TD Links classifications and making them more uh, macro so that, that the brand directors globally can look at the same type of activity around the world and see, okay, hey, if an Aperol Spritz is doing well in the U.S. in, in fine dining, is it doing well in London and Italy, et cetera? So we start out with this global segmentation uh, on a macro level, bring it to a local level, and, and look at um, uh, segmenting for the US market, as well as then at, at specific brand strategies with, with, with SKUs and drink strategies by channel as well. And then we give all that information to our trade marketing department, who then tries to turn that into executable programs for us. We have yearly goals. Uh, a calendar uh, that we adhere to through through the tool. So brand specific by segment, this is where you need to focus. Yeah, and and it was said earlier today too. We are really all about uh, right brands uh, in the right place at the right, with the right activity, and and we're seeing a lot of those results already. Well, we've been on Grapevines. We just had about I think our year anniversary, so this is all new for us as well. But we can see some some amazing results in a short period of time. Yeah. Now, Rebecca, different type of company. Completely. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and smaller, let's be, let's be honest. Um, but you're, um, how, how, who, de who defines that strategy for you so that you make sure you're selling your brands to the right accounts uh, at the right time? Sure. You know, let me um, back up for a second and just define uh, who Gurvich is. And we are, you're sitting in a building today that um, came to an existence over 40 years ago. So we're an iconic um, winery based on a man who is uh, a Vintner Hall of Fame inductee. His items sit in the Smithsonian. He has been friends with Robert Mondavi and some of the iconic winemakers of the Valley. He has worked his life to make this building and the winery today what it is. And we all live by the example that he sets, which is you know, basically you know, work hard every day, we're learning something new, which is what we're doing with grapevines, and we're also making friends. So our strategy has been set by his lifestyle and what he and his daughter Violet Gergich want to achieve for all of us. And that is really, I mean, our strategy is we make friends. We make friends with the wine, the quality wine that we make every day. And that's really, we have five SKUs that our wholesale team dedicates their work to. Um, we're small, 
I have a winery direct team in California. We have about six people that work in California. And then we have our U.S. distributors. And we went completely opposite. We don't add more people to our U.S. distributor. That's what everybody wants us to do is, hey, you need to have somebody in Texas. You need to have somebody in New York. You need to have these representatives helping us alongside of you sell your product. We went completely opposite because, honestly, we found that we had people in the market we didn't know what they were doing. They were spending a lot of money in accounts. They were traveling all over the place. And we weren't seeing the results in our depletion. So we backed ourselves up and said, hey, let's try to work this backwards. So we took them all away. I have one national sales manager. And I have one ambassador that travels out and handles kind of our key account. We've identified who those key accounts are based on the sales history that we see. And we make him in charge of making that touch point and making friends. We found out that the people that we had in Florida didn't know any of the key buyers that were actually in that market. And so that was his main purpose and job is shake their hand, make a friend, do what Mike Gergich used to do, go out with his little beret and sample the wine. So that's really what Grapevines has enabled us to do and any kind of CRM platform is to collect your contacts, find your friends, and make sure that you're touching them because the touch points matter. Absolutely right. Does your marketing team, or do you, as a company, um, how do you target the right accounts? How do you know which are the right accounts to, 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 to try to get into, or, or direct your distributors to try to execute in? Yeah, and we've been all over the place with that. You know, We've had a lot of good intentions in the past, and without actually having a place to house all that information, it lived with individual people. And that was one of my biggest frustrations, is whenever we have, again, we're winery direct in California, so whenever I had a salesperson leave the area, I didn't have any of the contacts, any of the people. All I knew is that there was sales that we were getting from these particular accounts. And we weren't actually quantifying them too much other than they're selling a lot and what are they selling. So we decided to start housing all that information. Now we actually get to see who our top 20 accounts are for each particular territory and market, and we can actually spend a little more time. We also do put little check boxes in our system for are you an influencer? You might not be the best account or the best person for us, but are you influencing other accounts? So those are the things that we've checkboxed. This is an influencer. Are they a wine spectator account? Are they a wine um, enthusiast or any of those kind of radar high profile accounts? If they're coming out in those publications, I have a team in marketing and my assistant will go through and we'll look at the magazines and we'll start putting those. We have the checkboxes and grapevines and we check them. And then we, we put them in our system if they're not in our system. Because in California, we don't get BDN information. It's what we sell to is the only information that we get here. So if we're not prospecting and looking and putting those in our database, my team really doesn't know about them. Right. So that's what we're doing. From a strategic standpoint, Rick, <clears throat> um, who decides what are the right activities to kind of have your people go out and execute? So we, we sit in the... Uh you know, on the meet meetings upon meetings. And then from those meetings upon meetings, I, I basically decide what we think we can deliver as a sales organization and, and what goals should be given to, the, we call it a key account team. And, and they are, mm -hmm. our key account team is about 40 some people. They're in, you know, the trendy cities. They're, they're specific. They have about 75 to 80 accounts that they're responsible for. Those accounts are in Grapevines. And we do collect all the CRM data against that. So, um, uh, I basically decide, okay, what are the goals, what are the KPIs going to be for this key account team based on our company strategy, and then what goals should be uh, given to our national account team to see what they can execute, knowing that that strategy is a little bit different, more of the big drinks and the big menus um, on the national account side. And then we just put it all on a calendar to make sure it all works against our, our national calendar. And then really important is that it works with our distributor national calendar that we have as well, and so that we're all focusing on somewhat of the same brand or activity at the same time. Here's a, here's a loaded question. Are you, do you give your key account people volume goals? So this is year one, and um, we don't have volume goals for our key account reps, and we don't have volume goals for our, our national account reps uh, this year as well. Um, the volumes have increased dramatically on the key account side, so I'm hoping we don't mess it up, but, but we are going to give some... Uh, some, some volume goals as KPIs next year just so it aligns with our managers because the managers do have some volume goals and since, since what we're doing is new, we're not, a lot of other spirit suppliers might have these, they're basically brand ambassador type people that we hired in these key cities. So like in New York, we might have four, Denver, we might have one. 
Um, just depends on the city. Uh, but um, they're, they're basically like brand ambassador or key in influencer bartenders that, that like to educate is a, is a key part of their role. Mm -hmm. Cocktail creation with our portfolio is really, really important. Um, and then teaching them how to sell has been the, the biggest uh, challenge or, or opportunity. Um, but uh, uh, giving, them, giving them the information and, and keeping track of it has, has been uh, um, something that, that we're all working on on a yeah. daily basis. Yeah, but it's interesting you're not going out to these key account people and saying, hey, here's your 80 accounts. Um, go grow your business by 20%. Right. That's, that's not the way you're directing them effectively. It's by saying, here's your 80 accounts. Go execute these, this, these activities, right? And let's measure and give you goals based on the activities. Yeah, so, so a lot of the activities, we're actually doing a lot of social media uh, goals, KPIs, against our brands, Amplify and Reward. So we track social media. We, we use uh, Instagram is what we found for most of our accounts and the influencer bartenders and, and customers are, are more uh, Instagram focused. So all our guys are, are, are gold out on a monthly basis on, on certain brands. We have quarterly trainings on um, different activities to, to bring up their uh, social media acumen, whether it's it's doing um, video or certain, they'll have two or three specific things that we train them on, we reward them on, but they have yearly goals by brand on social media. We do things on, on features and menus. We have a thing called Perfect Glass where a lot of our products are, are modifiers, meaning um, like Negroni. Uh, we, we have a lot of products that, that, that are added to a cocktail. They're not the main base. So this perfect glass we came up with uh, is, is if, it's, if it's two or more products of our portfolio in a drink to make a cocktail, we, we're going out things like that. Uh, and then education is, is a big part. So we have uh, KPIs on, on monthly trainings against each of our key brands or categories. Right. Yeah. So Rebecca, what are the key activities you look for your brand ambassador to do when they're out? Obviously meet people and do a lot of that, mm -hmm. you know, basic kind of see more basic CRM Kind of relationship building, it sounds like. Yeah, and we're, we're again, we're fairly, we're, we're adopting the CRM very slowly. We tried two years ago a different kind of format on Salesforce. It wasn't working for us, and then we found great finds, and it, it does work for us. But we're, we're baby-stepping our way into how we want to program our team and get better with our KPIs. But one of the things that we absolutely know, that when we do certain things, we win and we sell, and that's when we do events. Those events can be anywhere from consumer sampling events in a store or at a country club, or specifically when we're doing dinners. Um, we know that we sell a lot of wine. We just had Violet Gergic over in uh, Georgia. We have um, somebody that we've been following from La Quinta property in the desert who's become a really good friend of ours. We kept track of him as he moved over to Georgia called a Reynolds Plantation, which is a phenomenal uh, club, multifaceted, lots of money there. Um, he's become somewhat of an ambassador for Gergic. So he's somebody who said, hey, I want Gergic here because of the friendship that we have. And he also wanted to have Violet come in and do a dinner. Um, we worked out a program where we have, um, we just had four um, of their membership come here yesterday because we have this relationship where they can send us guests and we'll give them complimentary services because we're their partner account for us because of his relationship. And Violet um, went in and she, we, we told him, you know, our parameters to send Violet Gurgic, we're very upfront with what we need in order to do a wine dinner. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, you're gonna, commit to selling so many cases. If it's someone like me coming in, it's about 20 cases. If it's somebody like Violet coming in, it's over 30 <laughs> cases because it's it's something that we have to commit to to travel, get her out there. She's very busy. So he already knew he had to sell at least 30 cases of wine to have her there. And he sold 46 just to the consumers that night. And he also sold it, we sold it to the account for the actual event because we don't give wine away. We sell wine. That's what we do. So sounds like a great <laughs> sounds like a great program that returns results. So the yeah. question is now you're going, are you going to start setting goals for how many yes. of those dinners you need to that's, do? That's already happening. Yeah. We, we do that with our GHE event platform, and they customized and built something very specific for us. It's a little, it's complicated on how we actually look at our events, so it had to be customizable, but we, um, we target events where we want to be with events, so a certain account, so we have a target field on that now, and then we um, actually complete events and do the follow-up whether we want to do them or not, and that includes in-store sampling. We just got done doing... Um, 
um, a huge rounds. For the first time, we're actually starting to do in-store samplings with Safeway. That's not something that Gurgich normally would do. It's expensive for us. We don't have a lot of money, but where we do want to partner up with key customers like Safeway and or ones that we want to encourage like Ralph's, we'll start, we're starting to do that. And a really great feedback from our call the other day, we have the broad market team and we have um, just the regular house chains team. And we just got done doing the Ralph sampling in October, like October 19th, 20th. And that broad market um, individual said, I just had somebody come in to one of my accounts and want to buy two cases of the Chardonnay because they sampled it at the Ralph's location and thought it was the best and they right. didn't have enough product from there so they went over here and bought it. Right. We love that feedback. That's great. So that's tracking our events. So we'll put that in and I'll feed that information back to Kroger in Cincinnati and also to the Ralph's buyer to let them know that, hey, here's the follow-up and the feedback that we've received and can you give us a few more SKUs of distribution? <laughs> there you go. There you go. You got to <laughs> leverage like that. that. Yeah. There was an article, by the way, yesterday in case you guys didn't see it, Wine Spirits Daily. Um, it's about craft spirits but it's pretty interesting and relevant. It says retailers want more craft tastings. These guys, somebody did some research, and I don't know how many they talked to, but it says um, a whopping 80% of retailers, both on and off premise, say there is a need for more uh, craft spirit tastings. Okay, so now you're having a retailer say, telling us, this is what drives my business. I want more tastings. Mm -hmm. right? So if you have some people in the field or you have some resources to do tastings, it's clearly a sales driver, right? How many of these tastings can you do? How many cases do you sell when you do a tasting, right? Start to build a plan and go and execute it and, and watch the sales flow, right? Um, so, so Tim, I'm going to jump in for one yeah, second because yeah. we don't just track GHG events. We also track the people that are coming through this winery, and that actually... Um, really gives us really great results and lets our, our distributors know who's been here for possible leads. So we do take that information. All the business cards, any of you are dropping business cards, and if you're actually with somebody that we're interested as far as a key account, or you're still going in the system, whether you like it or not, you're going to be in our <laughs> system. <laughs> but um, we'll, we'll have those come up, and then we'll actually, the team downstairs in our tasting room will tell us, did that person buy anything? Were they interested in something? Um, and then we'll go back to our distributor and said, do you know that XYZ person was in here? Now that might have been the sous chef. That might have been just the chef, but chefs have really good influence over the wine list. So we'll tell them and say, hey, you have a possible lead here. This person loves the Paris tasting Chardonnay, and wouldn't that be great to have that on the list over there? So we're constantly trying to make sure that we're feeding leads to people. We had a great example. I'm going to give one. Sorry, Tim, because I'm, okay. I'm long-winded. But it's really good to hear the sales results out of it. We had... Um, Somebody that my uh, my sales rep in California did not know, he's San Francisco based, did not know that this person that was from that account was coming in, but um, made an appointment through um, just calling in and said, hey, I'd like to come in. And so we put her information in the system. That was then fed over to that sales rep who goes, oh my God, this is an account I've been trying to get into for 17 years. It's a really great Marriott property in downtown San Francisco. So he emailed her and said, hey, you know, I've been really trying to get to your food and beverage manager is are you the person now buying and she goes no but that's my boss and i'm happy to help you out to get that appointment he did get that appointment he went in the food and beverage manager is whirling around really busy but he ended up selling 24 cases of wine to him that day nice. awesome Great. result well that ties into the sort of next place we're going is look okay we we, we talked about uh defining a strategy what brands you want to sell to which accounts mm -hmm. and 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 some of the right and, and figuring out which activities you want to do that you know drive your sales so rick Next step is, how do you get your team in the field to actually focus on those specific things? Yeah, so what we do is, is we set up a, uh, a yearly KPI dashboard, and, and it's against all the different activities, whether it's, it's education, uh, menus, uh, points of distribution. We, we took the segmentation to not just um, uh, at a sub-channel like a TD Links with, with our global segmentation, but we also did it by category. So we said, okay, what are, because with our portfolio, we've got bourbon, we've got tequilas, we've got rums, et cetera. We also uh, targeted uh, different types of distribution at, at bourbon type of accounts or tequila type of accounts. So we've got goals at, at categories as well. And then looking at where we think the consumer is, uh, what brand should be in, in the same kind of account. So, so in... Uh, in certain accounts where we know fine dining as a global strategy, well, we think Aperol and Campari uh, naturally should be in the same type of account, so we'll have uh, goals against that. 
uh, as well. So not just fine dining, but also category specific and then trying to pair up multiple brands where we think the consumer is. Um, and they've got that, that's, a, that's tracked daily. We use, um, all the rad comes through through VIP. We, uh, Grapevines has done a great job. We brought in um, NAPCA uh, data, rad data for all the markets. We brought in uh, from Oregon, we bring in the, the 09 data. So we get, we get rad data from Oregon, which as a, as a company, Campari, uh, previous to our arrangement uh, uh, last year with Grapevines, we just saw market, you know, depletions at the brand level, and we didn't get any uh, channel specific, let alone let alone account data in a lot of the control states. And Texas now too. And and we brought in Texas uh, this year. We've been using Y Drink, so we're getting all the rad on premise account data uh, for Texas. So at least where we have our people, which right now we're in um, uh, on the key account side, we've got. Uh, uh, 29 cities and 19 states covered, we are getting rad data for every person so we can really measure their results in those specific accounts. And that's that's been a big uh, big help to figuring out, okay, what, what are they doing? Do we have the right info? Do we have the right goals for them? Uh, and then how are we measuring them? And, and they're seeing their dashboards on a daily basis with their results. Uh, control state still monthly, uh, but they're, they're, everyone else are seeing the results on a daily basis, which has been great. All right. And, and I know you guys have set some seasonal uh, goals for certain activities, certain programs, but then you also have some annual stuff. We talk about consistency, right, especially with wholesalers. And, and Rebecca, I, I, you know, when you're managing wholesalers to help execute primarily, uh, it, it's, uh, it's tricky to, um, uh, to try to go to a wholesaler and keep, you know, change things seasonally. Mm -hmm. Rick, how have you found um, the seasonal style goal versus more of a long-term um, branded KPI that you want someone to execute against over time. Which one works better? So um, I, I think we, we use, like with our trade marketing department, we use these 30, 60, 90 day programs that all are intended to support the yearly goal, with, whether it's a it's, uh, uh, Negroni week type of a focus on, on a national program or a focus market type program in certain cities. Um, we definitely get the quick bang for the buck on the focus periods, and we see that too in, in the menus where um, uh, a feature is going to get more lift than a permanent menu. So those quick hits, whether it's, it's, it's account specific with a drink or it's, it's a national program, uh, the, the short focus time periods are what, what deliver the greatest results. Um, and the key, though, for us is because I think someone said it. There's, you know, yeah, there might be ten goals, but there's really forty goals within those ten goals. Is, is making sure that within those goals, that the programs are are really specific to helping achieve against those goals. That we're not going in eight million other directions. Because now that we're seeing all this great information, as you know, we we want more and try and keep doing it better. Um, there's a lot of information out there, and, and these guys are just on the street calling on those that 80-20 rule, those 75 best influencer type of accounts in a city that probably has 20 people a day trying to uh, schlep them booze, yeah. right, on a daily basis. Yeah. So yeah. how do we keep them focused and, and support them with, with programming that's gonna be impactful, right. that matters, and that also uh, that the distributor can execute it because they're the ones that have to ship the product. That's right. So Rebecca, when you're more, more managing wholesalers, are you giving them sort of a, a, a more annual type of, of, uh, of, of performance metrics to work against? Yeah, so last year, and specifically regarding marketing and seasonality things, we sent out our full year calendar, so they have the vision to it all year long, and then we repeat that same message on the header, because we send out monthly to all of our distributors um, our monthly sales and marketing update from Gerga Chills, everything you need to know, right? It's their one-stop shop for all their accolades, all the information that's going on at the winery, and inclusive as that, on the top is always our marketing calendar, whether we're focusing on Chardonnay, right now we have our library release, so we've let everything that we want to go out, go out to the market as far as here you can have some uh, 1999 Cabernet and vertical, this is what you can have access to. So we usually do that. From a seasonality um, standpoint, I found that that's less effective normally with our distributors because they need us to be consistent. We're Gurgit Hills. It's not like they think they need to do a lot with us other than to sample and sell our wine, which is true. But we did try um, hashtag Merlot me. I don't know if any of you heard that. It was just for the month of uh, October. So that was run by Duck Horn and a couple of others of us in the Valley um, who have Merlot. We wanted to really get behind supporting Merlot. And so we did hashtag Merlot me for one month, but we decided to use um, a campaign tool in Grapevines. 
and it's a tool that you can send out an email blast to all of your contacts or your specific contacts. And we did that to say, hey, we're involved with hashtag Merlot. If you're interested in buying our Merlot for this program, please let us know. Yeah. And we got hits. We can see who's opened those emails. We can see who's interested. We have some of them that opened it 27 times or send it on to site. You know, it's like, really, this is great. So they're interested. I'm going to pick up the phone and call them. And some of them were emailing us back and saying, hey, tell me a little bit more about your Merlot. So it's just casting a wide net, huge net on the seasonality pieces, which we found was really effective. Do you measure how many contacts, account level contacts you have in the system? Yes. I mean, yeah. We, we, that's one of the first things we mandated our team to do is load your contacts. When we sent out the first um, very specific marketing um, sales thing that we did, that email campaign, um, those that didn't have contacts in really felt the pain from a sales perspective because all their other counterparts were saying, oh, I got 15 hits, five new appointments, I sold 20 some. They were just like, oh, well, I need to get my contacts in. Right. So, you know, for those of you who don't know, right, some basic CRM is you gather contacts with their email addresses and you can filter those contacts by market or t account segment or whatever, even by how much product they've bought and do email blasts to them. Did you know that you could do that within the Grapevines tool you all own today and That's see awesome. if they opened it or didn't open it? That's awesome. <laughs> if you're not and you're interested in that, talk to us, right, because it's great. Now, here's the next thing is we could measure that too. Mm -hmm. Of the people that got the email, what have their sales done yep. over time, right? Yep. Um, so we can start to measure the effectiveness of these campaigns. We can obviously measure the effectiveness mm -hmm. of a menu. We're going to show some of that stuff later on some really neat dashboards to show what kind of lift you get out of what these activities that you're executing, which I'm sure is really interesting to everybody. Um, we can't give away a lot of secret sauce from everyone's you know, strategies, but we're going to show you some neat things to help you analyze how are these activities actually driving sales? Okay, so we're going to get into some of that. Um, so next, uh, you know, how do you measure and report on the success um, of these executing these, these KPIs? Um, I have been in ro sales roles with big suppliers where, um, you know, I'd be riding up in the elevator with our CEO, and he would say things like, you know, so uh, how's it going? You say, oh, it's going well, you know, and he says, how's, how's it going with brand X? And if your reply was, oh, we're doing great, you know, the numbers are up, he would look at you, I mean, he would just laser right through you and be like, oh, yeah, what are the, what, what's driving that business? What are you doing to grow? And if you don't have an answer, you, you know, you, what do you say, I don't know, or, boy, consumers are just really picking it up faster. I mean, you know, you know the excuses you get or the, the reasons you get. Well, for me, the measurements about the performance should be, What's driving that growth? Oh, well, we've targeted the top you know, 90 white tablecloth restaurants to do menu placements and staff trainings in the next 90 days, and we've got 80% of them doing it. Oh, right, now, now I know how's it going and why is it going well, right? So the analytics behind measuring your success against execution and the sales results is absolutely critical to validating your whole strategy and managing your team. Rebecca talked to you, you used to have people out in the field. How many brand ambassadors or whatever did you have around? Five or six? We, had, uh, we have four regional managers out there, yeah. And, and you found out that they weren't really visiting accounts or they weren't yeah. doing much, right? So take the other example, Rick's got a team now, right, that's, he knows their account, they know their accounts, he knows exactly how many activities and account calls and menus and they're doing and he knows what it's delivering, right? So. It's, uh, it really shows you that, um, I don't want to call it micromanaging your sales team, but just managing your sales team to do the right things uh, really delivers value, right? And you can prove it. So, Rick, what are some of the key metrics and reports that you like to look at? I mean, I, you like the dashboards with the sort of the summaries of what percentage of your goals have you met? And uh, tell me some, some of the... Yeah, right, right like now, because it's new and, you know, we... we added all these people, so our numbers are up, so I like looking at everything, <laughs> sharing it out. Uh, but uh, besides, you know, seeing some of the volume and, and, and things you mentioned, a couple of the reports, um, what's been most interesting is this activity versus goal, so where we see, uh, hey, our, our, our portfolio, our focus portfolio on one team is maybe 12 brands, so, so focus brands and focus type of accounts, and uh, to say that the portfolio is growing at 20% without any activity, just just around the country, this this portfolio is growing about 20%. Uh, 
where we, uh, and we, we look at this on a, on a monthly basis now, but, but uh, a feature uh, against this brand or portfolio, if we get a feature, it, it's, it's growing at 44%. If we get a training or social media around that account, around the, it, it, these are all 38 to 44% growth off of a, a regular baseline of 20%. So that activity versus goal is, is something that we look at to see how we're doing. And then two right now, because we're setting all our goals for next year, uh, deciding, okay, what are those main activity drivers that, that really make a difference for us as a company and for our brands? And we can look at them by segment as well and, and be real specific with saying, okay, look, this, uh, this perfect glass idea sounded cool, but it's not really driving anything and it's sort of a pain for the sales guys and the managers that track and do their one-on-ones with. So because we know it's not driving as much as, as training or a feature, let's really continue to simplify and focus on, on what matters most. So that's, that's a great report. And then because, uh, and this is more for Italy, they're, every quarter we have to send them a report because they just gave us the checkbook to, to hire all these people, which we have not done at Campari before. But um, you know what, what does having this key account person in the market mean to the portfolio? So we look at this, this territory comparison report is what I look at and I, I'm selling internally uh, to our company all the time that basically shows a, in, in a market where we have one, two, three, four key account people, uh, and, and those accounts, the portfolio is growing X. How's the rest of the on-premise growing against the same uh, portfolio in either volume or uh, points of distribution or velocity? And so we have a report built that shows us that, and, and it's pretty amazing. I mean, right now it's, it's about three times the, the volume, three times the point of distribution all in percentages versus the rest of the market, and that's a real impactful report that's wow. it's great for us to share and also aha moment when we're sharing it with our um, with our internal teams that can use that to go go work with the distributor to, to get some real programs. Speaking of that, how do, how do you share those kind of results with the distributors? Do you have a formal way to do it or is people just doing it on a local basis with their with the market managers with their distributor or, or how, how do you do that? Yeah, so so it's unique where, where Grapevines, we're using it currently really just for our customer focus team. So, so trade marketing and all the brand ambassadors are using it. Our, our key account team and the national accounts team are using it. Um, the distributor facing team is not using it yet. Uh, so they're having those, those conversations, either waiting for the distributor information or using our own internal diver information, et cetera. And um, so every month uh, we've got this great rich data and information now that says, look, look at what we're doing, that they're used to write programming state market, maybe a point of distribution, which we know doesn't really matter to your point, having uh, you know the right, right activity is what matters in, in the right type of account. And so monthly, uh, we're we're putting together a mini, you know, five six slides of the key metrics of what's happening in the territory. Uh, that the people in Texas, for instance, are talking to our internal team in in a in a in a deck that's consistent across the country, knowing that it's not just for our internal team, but knowing it probably gets forwarded right to the distributor team. And then on a quarterly basis, uh, we're going around manage my managers. We, I've got uh, five managers around the country managing this one team. And then I'm going out and we're, we're having these, these meetings with the distributor and our internal teams at the same time. And this is what worked. This is what we're working on. And that helps us make sure we've got, um, you know, if we've got a program in 90 days, that we've got inventory order, yeah, that we've got the, the right pricing in place to help make everyone successful. So it's, it's just a lot of over communication. Mm -hmm. I think we were talking about communication yeah. earlier. Yeah. Um, but having it in a consistent uh, format across the country for everyone to share out. So Rebecca, when you, you know, maybe have a market visit, for example, and you get some success and some wins. And uh, what are those key kind of bullet point metrics and highlights you like to send back to the distributor to tell them, this is what we did and this is how well it worked? Yeah, so we, um, on a monthly basis, we're always sending out their scorecard results is what we call it, especially for our major markets. And we use a couple things on grapevines because we found that they're just really easy for us to cut and paste and just share with them really simply in an email because we can't be everywhere. We don't do quarterly business reviews and get in live in front of everybody. We only do it with a segment of the group. So with the rest of them, there is a KPI dashboard that we have set up, which is their sales, their depletions. It also has the number of events that either we've done or they've done in the market and then it also has um, the account calls and we do make account calls all the time because you just heard me say we're touching those accounts it doesn't matter that email campaign blast will go out to accounts outside of California it goes everywhere so we're telling them how many times we've touched accounts for them so that's the standard dashboard and then the other report that I really like to use is the um, top 20 dashboard which actually shows top 20 
on-premise accounts and their rolling 12 volume up or down and off-premise rolling 12 up or down. And then it shows the SKUs on which are performing the best. And then we always like to see Chardonnay performing the best. And if someone's skewing towards cab, well, we know they're taking the easy route because cab's the easiest right. one to sell. Right. So we're like, hey. So we show, we show those two for external. Internally, we do something quite different because right. it's more visibility for the internal group. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, do you find that sharing the results of your team's activities with the distributor, do you find that actually gets the distributor to, to do more for you in, as a, in return? I mean, how does that help with the relationship, I guess, is the... Mm -hmm. Uh, sure. I mean, yeah, absolutely. They, they obviously want us out there selling as much for them as that we possibly can, but um, they'd love it if we had 10 people in each market, I'm sure. So, <laughs> I mean, so we just can't do that, but yeah. Yeah, and, I, and for us the same. It's, uh, I think at the beginning it was, it was um, even internally, it was, okay, hey, we're going to be these 75 accounts or 300 accounts in a market. We're going to own that relationship and that activity uh, and that programming, and that, that was hard for us as a uh, culture uh, internally to to separate, and then also um, having this new level at, at the distributor, uh, it took some time. But once we started showing results, and, and hey, look at for Russell's Reserve Bourbon. Look, this th these five guys in Texas are they've got a goal to do this, this, and this, and that should get you an extra hundred cases. So if your goal is to get 150 cases, you only have to go figure out a way to sell 50 more cases. We're going to take care of the rest. So once that communication relationship worked itself out. Everything's been been really smooth and they'd love to hear our successes because we're, we're our, the role is to help them mm -hmm. achieve their goals. That's right. And it's a team effort. I mean, I, I've been working for big suppliers, small suppliers. When I was at a small supplier, um, I mean, I, this was my experience. We would go and we'd execute and we'd make visits and work on menus and do staff trainings and promotions and accounts and, and, and help the distributor sell. And then we go into meetings with the executives at the distributor and tell them and show them what we've done. And you'd think they would say, oh, um, thanks for doing our job for us, and we'll see you later. It's actually the opposite. They actually say, this is amazing. Thank you so much. You know what? You, need a, you want a few more work with next month? You got it, right? You want to get on program next you know, month, and we'll want to do something for you on, for, from our team? You got it. Because distributors, is my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, distributors help those that help themselves. Um, and so I think there's a huge leverage factor mm -hmm. by you guys doing the kind of work you're doing and measuring and managing it so well with your teams. When you share that with a distributor, you become a preferred supplier in their minds, right? And that's worth a lot to get their support. So that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we're about finished here. Um, as I said, we're going to show more examples and some reports and some things a little bit later to get a little bit more deep dive. Before we do that uh, and, and get on to the next, is there any questions? Very good. Thanks, everyone. All right. <laughs>